Tyler, I can see you are back in a room I have not seen the shade carpeting walls of in a really long time. And that is the actual jungle studio, the IRL jungle studio back at Lawfare offices. How is it in there? I think I can tell that likewise, the studio hasn't seen many people in a while. It seems like frozen in time. It's a little creepy. I don't think it's it's quite so jungly anymore. I think the jungle died. Not only has the jungle died, I think it is at this point decomposed back into soil. So we have some fertile fertilizer lying around on the ground in there. Sadly, uh, I don't think we got a lot of light through those through those shade carpeting uh, sound blockers that we have hung over the window. I actually had there to are, open however, the door. There's a lot of alcohol. So <laughs> enjoy yourself, Tyler. <laughs> That's what I said. If you hear the clank of bottles in the background, just ignore it. If Tyler goes blind halfway through this episode, we understand what, what, what has happened. It's those gifts. Some of those are gifts from rational security listeners that, that you know, in-house secret, we're, we're really scared to drink any of them. So mostly they're mostly for display. So don't tap into them if they haven't been tapped into yet, because uh, those are ones we don't, we don't know the providence of. Well, to the, law, to the uh, rational security listeners, thank you for uh, making my afternoon that much more amusing. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rational Security 2.0, a.k.a. Rational Security Mava Reason. I am one of your co-hosts, Scott R. Anderson, and I am here with my other regular co-host, Quinta Jurassic. Hello. And our third co-host, unfortunately, is out uh, a little under the weather today, but we are thrilled to be joined in his Rational Security debut, Lawfare's new managing editor, Tyler McBride. Tyler, thank you so much for joining us here today. Hello. It's an honor. Ta-da. We are... Yeah, we finally got your voice on the Rational Security feed, although I think you have made your Lawfare podcast debut at this point, so we can't claim to be truly breaking uh, you know, the new stardom that is Tyler's uh, velvet tones out on the radio waves, uh, as we would like to be. Yeah, when you said, uh, unfortunately, I thought you were going to say we were unfortunately joined by Tyler McBrien, managing editor, but it is unfortunate that Alan is sick. It is. It is. But we are thrilled to have you here and to rope you into the new Rational Security contributing community. We have lots of new faces at Lawfare for those who have not been following on Twitter. Tyler is one of of several new folks we have coming in, replacing some of our old all-stars. And we are going to be hopefully getting a a number of them on the podcast over the coming weeks and months. Uh, But we're thrilled to have Tyler on here first to help us hash through some of the big national security news stories of this past week in what we are calling the Life After Cassidy edition. Um, because we've had a couple of big developments. The biggest, arguably, uh, is in relation to the January 6th committee and the testimony of one, Cassidy Hutchinson, a former junior White House aide, uh, who said some very interesting things last week that we were only able to allude to in last week's episode because the testimony had not yet happened. But there are a couple other stories that have also popped up that are pretty interesting that we're also going to dig into. Topic one for the day, Dean for a day. John Dean, that is. Surprise testimony by a former White House aide, Cassidy Hutchinson, has shed unprecedented light on Donald Trump's actions on January 6th and reinvigorated discussions of possible criminal charges, among other consequences. Was this the smoking gun we've been waiting for? What might it change moving forward? Topic two, the prince and the proffer. A federal judge has asked the federal government to weigh in on whether Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has sovereign immunity in relation to civil lawsuits over the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. What legal questions does this raise and what will the United States do? Topic three, when federalism gets weird. The Supreme Court has taken up Moore v. Harper, promising that we'll soon weigh in on the controversial proposition that the Constitution gives state legislatures authority over federal elections that even state constitutions and courts cannot supersede. What could this case mean for American democracy? For our first topic, I'm going to hand it over to me to get us started and introduce this first topic. Uh, Because as I mentioned, we had very, very eventful testimony. Some of the most dramatic testimony we've seen yet so far take place last Tuesday in the January 6th committee. This was a surprise hearing featuring one Cassidy Hutchinson, a a fairly junior individual at the White House, but a fairly senior aide in terms of her proximity to some of the figures in power, particularly Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, for whom uh, she was a lead assistant. Um, Cassidy Hutchinson provided testimony on what exactly she saw in the White House in some of the days leading up to, and perhaps most importantly, on the day of January 6th. It's particularly notable because this involves direct testimony about the actual actions uh, and statements of and knowledge of figures like Donald J. Trump, our former president, as well as Mark Meadows, Pat Cipollone, and a lot of the other key figures that we haven't heard direct testimony of 
and for whom that last connecting gap has always been a challenge. And for those saying, particularly for President Trump, some sort of accountability needs to be placed here because it is hard to break into that circle of elite advisors in testimony to really pin down what the president knew when and how he was involved. Quinta, you have been our chief watcher for all the January 6th committee developments. Tell us, how groundbreaking was this testimony and what do we think it might change? I like the title of Chief Watcher. I think that's that's very good. First, let me begin with a bit of annoying pedantry. I think that this is this is less of a John Dean moment and more of an Alexander Butterfield moment. So if listeners recall, Alexander Butterfield was the, the special assistant to the president who revealed in a surprise hearing um, during Watergate that there was a, a taping system. And I now see that Scott's trying to redeem himself. So let me give him an opportunity to do that. I had that thought. It's really hard to come up with puns about her, about <laughs> Butterfield. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Butterfield per day just doesn't have the same ring for, to it. It doesn't work there quite the same way. I can't believe it's not Butterfield. Oh, God damn it. Oh, Scott. God damn it. That's really good, Tyler. You're on the Google Doc. Way in with these things, buddy. <laughs> Damn it. All right, we'll, we'll switch it up in the Twitter feed. We'll see. Now that we've established that we gave this segment the wrong title, um, I do think, I mean, oh. the, the Hutchinson testimony was genuinely astonishing, and I feel like that people say that a lot. Um, certainly they have during the... Uh, January 6th hearings, during previous hearings about misconduct by Trump. But this is the only hearing that I can ever remember actually just saying in the middle of like, oh my God. Um, it was completely astonishing. I think it more than lived up to the hype precisely because as you say, Scott Hutchinson, because she was working so closely with Meadows, who was working so closely with Trump, um, had a window into what Trump was doing, what he was saying, what people around her said he was, he was doing and saying on the sixth. Um, and the vision that it presents is incredibly damning. So we know from Hutchinson's testimony and she, by all of, you know, appearances is a very serious, incredible witness that Trump uh, knew that the crowd listening to his speech on the 6th was armed, that he knew that they intended to go to the Capitol, that he wanted to go to the Capitol himself, that he, I think quite importantly, sent that tweet saying that Mike Pence had let him down. I can't recall the exact wording. Um, after he had been told that rioters were looking for Mike Pence to potentially kill him, and per Hutchinson's memory, uh, Meadows essentially said uh, he thinks that they're right, uh, that Mike, I, I believe the, the exact words were that Mike deserves it. Um, and altogether, I think it paints what is just an extraordinarily damning picture about Trump's conduct on that day. It is a pity that we don't have Alan with us today because he, he, along with uh, Judge Sugarman and Lawfare, wrote a, a big piece about how uh, Hutchinson's testimony had changed their minds and they now think that a uh, criminal indictment of Trump on a, a number of counts would is potentially uh, likely or, or justified and they, they hadn't before. So I do think it sort of substantially moved the ball forward. Oh, and, and I should also mention um, before, <laughs> before I let Tyler get a word in, uh, the element of obstruction of justice, which I also also think is is super important. So the committee ended the hearing by putting up uh, text messages, comments that witnesses coming before the committee had apparently received. It later turned out that Hutchinson had received some of those, um, essentially saying, we, you know, Trump world, uh, know that you're testifying. Uh, we're going to read the transcripts. We value your loyalty. Really like mob stuff uh, and stuff that seemed extremely similar to the section of the Mueller report where Mueller sets out potential obstruction of justice by Trump in, in trying to dissuade witnesses from cooperating with the special counsel investigation. So that is is deeply concerning. Yeah, I think, you know, as someone who falls well below chief watcher, maybe I could be petty watcher of, of the January 6th hearings. Um, I would chief petty watcher. Give yourself some credit. Maybe, You're I'll, like I'll a sous chef. Deputy chief petty watcher. Okay. Um, I think a few kind of sideline things that came up for me were first that Mark Meadows seems like a deeply unpleasant person to work for. There are quite a few scenes where he is on his phone. He's not acknowledging um, Cassidy Hutchinson's questions, um, things of that nature. It just doesn't seem like a great boss. Uh, and and kind of related to that, something that a few outlets have have been highlighting is is the very young, you know, young 20-something aides who have such close proximity to power and 
in this case, I think that became a real boon for the committee um, to have someone like that testify. Not to be ageist, but it's it's just an interesting aspect of Washington that I think hasn't been highlighted before. I found that really interesting too. And I think that, you know, we learned something about that dynamic from um, Alyssa Farah, who used to be in the Trump White House on communications and who uh, apparently has been in communication with Hutchinson and went on CNN and essentially said that Hutchinson had gotten a lawyer that was paid for by the Trump team um, and then was dissatisfied with that lawyer, felt like she had more to say and ended up getting a, a different lawyer and there there's and and then cooperating more with the committee and there's some interesting dynamics there right you know she's i think 26 presumably she she can't pay for counsel of the the caliber that the trump camp was providing but then i did wonder if there's also an element of sort of not being quite so deep in the machine um that you're a little more able to kind of take a step back and say i don't want to be a part of this and i do want to come forward with what i know yeah i think that's one of the more interesting parts about Cassidy Hutchinson as an individual and the structure that kind of fits in here. Because our focus has always been uh, on if we're going to connect Trump to this, we need to get major witnesses. You actually got to get into that inner circle. And she's this kind of backdoor into that inner circle precisely because she had that level of access at this junior level, but somehow didn't rise to the level either. She didn't rise to the level that they seriously made an effort to try and make her part of that circle of people that have a political incentive not to fully cooperate. Um, or, uh, you know, she actually looks at her long-term political future as a 24-year-old and says, maybe, you know, my career is going to extend beyond Donald Trump if he ever does come back into office and the circle of people around him. And people aren't going to look at what I'm doing favorably in that regard. That's a very cynical take on the calculus she may have entailed. But, you know, I think it feeds in there that there's a bit of a different perspective if you're Mark Meadows, who is already at the apex of his career and is really going to rise and fall his legacy on Donald Trump. And somebody like Hutchinson, who is just not in that position, has a long career ahead of her, potentially. Um, and looking at figures like John Dean, for example, of frankly turned a moment, uh, a questionably heroic moment of the moment, played it right and has turned it into a pretty promising career as a public commentator, among other things. And I think that's actually kind of an interesting structure. And she struck me as uh, really having prepared for this testimony, you know, down to like really, you know, the white suit and white jacket and presentation and presentment and having worked and polished a lot of points, she was very clearly nervous, but had also very clearly practiced what she was going to say, I think, in the conciseness of her answers and the directness of the, um, and I think that there's just an element of that here about saying she, she had a different set of incentives than other people. I, that said, I'm a little hesitant to jump on the bandwagon that this is totally the smoking gun because I'm just not sure it actually gets us as close to Trump himself as we would need to be to support a criminal prosecution that's of that the level level of political controversy. But I think it gets us a lot closer. And the way it does that, I think, is probably two different ways. Um, one, it really puts the political uh, future of the Trump circle, I think, in a lot more doubt. Um, setting aside whether you know anything she says will be admissible in a court, whether it's hearsay, things like that, which I think you would actually encounter problems with a lot of it if it were you know a criminal trial. Uh, you know, she has damaged the political brand enough that the incentive for people sticking close to Trump, I think, is probably in the decline. And then perhaps even more importantly, she's brought up a lot of points and could be a very credible witness, including avoiding any hearsay issues or other issues she might have in regard to um, in regard to specific figures around Trump like Mark Meadows, like Rudy Giuliani, particularly now with this obstruction of justice point that has come after January 6th in recent weeks relating to Mark Meadows, that gives DOJ a lot of leverage over them because those are very promising grounds for criminal prosecution, I think, much more promising than something based off just we know against Trump and may give them incentives combined with the declining political future of the Trump circle to say, well, this is a time to flip or this is time to begin maybe cooperating a little bit more on the DOJ side, if not the committee side. Um, so I, I kind of see this as an important step in that direction. I'm just not sure if this actually gets us there, but it's the biggest step I think we've seen yet. I mean, I think what you're what you're getting to is that there are sort of two separate questions when we think about criminal culpability for Trump. One is, is the evidence there to support a charge? And then the second is, is the evidence there such that a potentially gun shy DOJ, or to put it a little more kindly, a DOJ that is taking this decision very seriously, uh, feels like it is enough to sort of get them into a place where a case is 
genuinely bulletproof, right? Um, and so my feeling is that I think at this point we have crossed the the line into that the the facts certainly seem to be there to support a charging decision. The question is, at what point does Merrick Garland look at this and say, okay, this evidence is so overwhelming that if we don't charge, uh, that in itself will be damaging. And that, I think, is a a very difficult and a much harder question. I do think that the the wit- potential witness tampering does open a lot of possibilities because, I mean, that's <laughs> it's it, the, the messages that they had on the screen. I mean, you could not ask for a clearer example of witness tampering. Like it's just right there. And so I do wonder. Reportedly, one of those messages came from Meadows. I do wonder if this means that Meadows has opened himself up to criminal exposure. Which, again, maybe not the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree. Um, whether that means that prosecutors might be able to leverage that to get more information on Trump, I don't know. But it does seem like this unspools a lot of different possibilities. Yeah, all I all I can think of the more I see these witnesses come forward is going back to those remarks we heard Attorney General Garland make, I think at the beginning of this year or maybe the end of last year, as we started right before we saw the first Oath Keeper indictments and other indictments roll out around January 6th, where he said, addressing the concerns about how the pace of the investigation said, look, here's how you build a criminal investigation. You start with the low ranking people and then you build up. And it's a long, gradual process. And particularly when you're talking about the most senior people in a conspiracy, the highest ranking officials, you have to work your way there. You don't just start by indicting those people. You have to get other people in an indictment and then have leverage over them to make sure you can get the the evidence against those higher ranked people. And of course, Garland is somebody with a lot of prosecutorial experience in his own right as a former uh, assistant U.S. attorney uh, and federal prosecutor. Um, he's also somebody who has had a long storied career uh, and and I think has demonstrated a lot of patience. And that's just what I see this sort of procession and with the January 6th committee really playing into. It's putting a lot of fuel under the fire to make that climb up that ladder a lot easier. Yeah, I'll just say two things. First, the witness tampering piece has been, I think, particularly shocking, equal parts shocking and entertaining. I think in a way it reads like a bad mafia movie script. Some of the lines are almost like ripped straight from, you know, I can only think of good mafia movies right now, actually. So I won't, I won't put any on blast, but it's a, it's um, a rip off. It's a bad rip off of the Godfather. Exactly. It's a poor approximation. And second, I'll just to go back to, sort of the the characters or the witnesses themselves. Our discussion about Cassidy Hutchinson, I think, can be framed in, in a broader conversation of the role that the that the hearings have played for rehabilitating certain reputations of Trump um people in the Trump administration in the eyes of Democrats especially or or just liberals more broadly speaking. Um Certainly, Mike Pence um, has been has been painted as a hero in, in many ways um, for for doing his his duty, um, and and I think that, and I think the the opposite thing has been happening for for those Trump admin officials who have chosen not to cooperate. The whereas other Trump admin officials who have cooperated have been able to maybe um, distance them, themselves from Trump. Those who did not cooperate have have just dug themselves deeper. Um, and so I think that's that was maybe a smart calculation on Cassidy Hutchinson's part. Maybe that wasn't her calculation at all, but it certainly seems like an effect. I do think your, your point about Pence is really interesting, Tyler, and I've, I've found it kind of fascinating um, because while Pence's team was there, uh, his counsel, Greg Jacob, was on the Hill basically testifying to how important he felt it was that Pence, you know, did his duty, abided by his oath, certified the electoral vote, you know, uh, uh, stood up to all of this pressure that Trump was putting on him to keep Trump in power. Um, Meanwhile, Pence is out there, you know, I think quite clearly trying to sort of soft pedal criticism of Trump, uh, position himself for what seems to be very likely a presidential run for 2024 um, and and not, you know, going up there himself and making these statements. So I don't necessarily think you need Pence to really drive that point home, but I do find it kind of odd that there's kind of a split screen on Pence where on the one hand, he's, you know, he's a hero for not overturning the Republic. Thank you very much, Mike Pence. But on the other hand, he's 
trying to not play that up with the Republican base because he needs people to actually not think about that if he's going to get the Republican nomination, all of which I think will be moot when he, you know, places third in Iowa or something like that and his campaign goes down in smoke. You know, I think this would not be a good weekly check-in if we didn't engage in some rank speculation. Uh, I have a question, I think, for you in the first order, Quinta, but I'll ask you, Tyler, too. Uh, we've heard rumors, I think, recently confirmed by members of the committee that they've had a number of people come forward as additional witnesses since Hutchinson's testimony, so in the last week. And I'm curious, who do we think that is? Uh, you know, We've heard, actually, rumors that people in the Secret Service actually take issue with some of the characterization of the incident in which former President Trump was said to kind of like, by one account, assault <laughs> or grab at or otherwise lash out at a Secret Service officer about not taking them to the Capitol building. So maybe there's some witnesses kind of correcting the record a bit there, although it's hard to imagine the committee wouldn't chase that down a bit. The big fish is Pat Cipollone, somebody who obviously had took real issue with what was happening uh, in the White House on January 6th, but is also former White House counsel, has a lot of actually probably the strongest legal shield to preventing any sort of testimony. He's the John Dean. One. Yeah, perhaps that's right. I mean, he's he's, he's somebody literally who the has champion. legitimate. <laughs> well, yeah, and he has the professional reasons to actually kind of like respect attorney-client confidentiality because he wants to be a big deal lawyer moving forward, and you can't go squealing on your candidates. At the same time, he also wants to be credible enough that people will hire him. So there's a little bit of a balancing act there. Um, yeah, I want to curious about you all. Where are the parts of the stories we think we're going to get more information? Are we going to see more surprise hearings in the next week or two as these people roll forward uh, and the committee just gets started rolling? I think their next, I don't even know if we know when their next scheduled hearing is, but I know it's supposed to happen in July. Um, but maybe we'll see more of these kind of snap hearings come forward sooner with more details. What do you all think? So we know, yeah, so they, they've said that, um, I think the earliest that they'd said they would hold another hearing was the 11th when, when Congress is back in session. But that doesn't mean that we might not have another snap Snap hearing, as you put it. Um, I mean, we know that they've been sorting through this documentary footage from a British filmmaker. Apparently, there was just an endless supply of British filmmakers filming Trump and his associates around the six. I don't know why. Um, so they could get more information from that. I mean, my bet would probably be if there's going to be another witness who sort of cracks the thing wide open that it might be someone in someone similarly positioned to Hutchinson. You know, someone whose name we probably wouldn't know, right? Um, who is relatively junior, who sees everything, who is not thought about as someone who sees everything because, you know, these are very important people and they don't have the time to think about what a Cassidy Hutchinson sees. Um, and so it kind of makes sense to me that, that she came out of nowhere and that perhaps the next person might as well. Yeah, I'm curious, both of your thoughts, now that the dust has settled somewhat on this surprise hearing, why we think that Cassidy Hutchinson was a snap hearing, given the fact that she had testified quite a few times? My theory is the witness tampering. Um, uh, so, I mean, again, this is complete and total speculation. I know nothing. Uh, but my theory is that they were worried that if they delayed, she would back out um, and slash or they wanted to send a message to Trump Meadows and company like, don't mess with us, basically. Like, do, do not try this. We will call you on it. We have we have the receipts. We will put them up in front of everyone. Um, and that that was sort of what they were thinking. Or, you know, they're, they're just, you know, enormous drama queens, which could also be the case. I, I think that's definitely part of it. Because uh, it only seems like the only new evidence that we actually got that they hadn't already gotten was the witness tampering bit that slapped on at the very end, which is really damning and significant. But also, this isn't the only way you had to deal with that. I think my skeptical part of it is that I think part of this of this knew that they were going to get a lot of attention if they called a snap hearing with a surprise witness. And that's a good reason to say, well, we're going to keep our witness a secret. We're going to stir up a lot of drama and bring it in. We know that they are consulting with you know Hollywood producers and other people about how to best frame and present this information and get public eyes on it, which I think is very smart. And I do not hold this against them at all. I think it's brilliant, actually, uh, if this is, in fact, part of their calculus going forward. And I, and I wouldn't be surprised um, because they obviously... She is the one witness who provided, that they have so far, it seems, who provided such a compelling narrative that is so damning for Donald Trump himself that they wanted the most possible eyes on it. And I, I think they accomplished that. I mean, this was got a lot more coverage in their last few hearings. Um, and I, you know, I think that must have been part of their calculus. Maybe we can take some theatrical notes from the hearing for a Rational Security Snap podcast to get more, more ears on it. 
No more announcing our guests. Surprise <laughs> every, every, guests every only. Is a surprise. They're all named Cassidy. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> so from one uh, would-be authoritarian to another very much existing authoritarian, Scott's giving me a thumbs up. But, oh, again, and I got a great segue. Tyler. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, our next segment has to do with an interesting dilemma facing the Biden administration regarding Saudi Arabia. So uh, listeners may recall there is a, a lawsuit um, that has been filed against uh, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman for his role in the death of Saudi dissident Jamal Khashoggi. Um, There is now uh, a question as the lawsuit continues about whether or not um, Mohammed bin Salman is actually immune uh, from suit. Um, The argument being that perhaps he should have uh, head of state immunity um, or similar. So a court uh, in D.C. has asked the Biden administration to weigh in with its views on the subject. And I think we're we're waiting for them to speak up by uh, early August. So this raises a lot of sort of tricky legal issues and also, I think, foreign policy issues, especially now that a lot of people are quite angry at Biden for uh, holding a meeting uh, with Mohammed bin Salman after uh, previously sort of indicating that he was planning to ice out the Saudis because of the murder of Khashoggi. Um, So Tyler, let me turn it over to you. What do you make of this little quagmire? For me, one of the most interesting aspects of this particular quagmire is the timing. If you scan the headlines, this is a question, the immunity question has been sort of talked about for a couple of years now, I think since around maybe December 2020, or a year and a half rather. And now all of a sudden, this judge is sort of forcing the executive's hand to, to make a call on this. Um, this comes also just before President Biden's visit to Saudi Arabia. So I'm curious also what you think about about the timing, about why this judge um, forced the question now rather than perhaps after the after the visit. I also, the other aspect I wanted to get into is I find it really interesting the argument that the Crown Prince's lawyers are making. Uh, the immunity question, the immunity formula rather, wouldn't would be entirely settled if the Crown Prince was the king, wouldn't be much of a question at all. Uh, they're trying to make this sort of implicit argument that he's the de facto leader, but they can't quite explicitly make that argument either because I believe that would delegitimize the king at home, even though, wink, wink, everyone knows um, that the crown prince is heavily involved in, in running the affairs of Saudi Arabia. So they're kind of playing a delicate balance as well. Yeah, I think that really gets at the challenging legal issues here. Um, you know, this doctrine of foreign official immunity that is being invoked here is a really tricky one. Um, most sovereign immunity questions in the United States are actually resolved as a matter of statute now under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Um, but there are a couple issues relating to diplomatic immunities, which is handled by a separate kind of treaty regime and is a little more clarity. And foreign head of state immunities, in which the executive branch still plays the leading role. That used to be kind of an open question as to whether the FSIA kind of rules guided there as well. Supreme Court said they didn't in in 2010, as a case called Samantar v. Youssef. Um, And so it's really up to the executive branch to put forward its views that usually gets extensive deference from the federal courts, not necessarily categorical. Like I don't think every judge in the federal system thinks they have to defer to the executive branch, but in practice, the executive branch tends to get absolute deference. And I think it would claim it's entitled to absolute deference. Um, But head of state immunity usually extends, as Tyler noted, to the head of state. And that is not MBS. That is King Salman, his father, um, who made him crown prince uh, and could remove him as crown prince tomorrow. I mean, he doesn't actually have any entitlement to this position. He is the minister of defense, uh, in addition to being the crown prince. He has senior cabinet positions. I think he actually has one or two others as well, uh, or at least has in the recent past. That's not that unusual among kind of crown princes in the uh, Saudi royal system. Um, But uh, that doesn't inherently entitle you to these sorts of immunities. They're really reserved for the head of state. And in some cases, the foreign minister um, has kind of entitled role under international law. Uh, you, the one avenue they might be able to pursue something would be kind of a conduct-based immunity, basically arguing like, well, this is actually an act of of public policy. um, And therefore, you know, is entitled to a degree of sovereign immunity because this is an act of the state. That is a really hard argument for them to make because they've said publicly, like, this is actually was an outlaw group. This is at at most, you know, the, the crown prince wasn't happy with Jamal Khashoggi, but 
never would have ordered this direct you know, assassination of him. Um, and so they've already made this public case that this is, in fact, not an act of the state. Um, so it's a little hard, even though that's kind of a dubious case to be made, they'd have to reverse that and take a lot of public heat for saying, no, in fact, this was a public policy they're implementing. Um, so it really gets at this very tricky legal line that the State Department, speaking through the Justice Department in this case, will have to draw uh, if they were to weigh in here. There's a good chance they won't. Um, they, they're not actually obligated to respond to the judge's request. They can just say, hey, we don't have a view on this or we're not going to submit a statement now. It's not unusual in these cases for the government sometimes to choose not to weigh in until uh, an appellate level um, because there are multiple bites at the apple in this sort of case. Um, it's a little weirder for like sovereign immunity stuff that you see more district court action, but I, you know, I could easily see that being a reason, uh, an excuse to kick the can down the road and say, let's see what the judge says on his own. Um, but, you know, it, it definitely puts in a tricky position because of the dynamics around Saudi Arabia and oil markets right now um, that they, of course, play this dominant hand in. I'll just add President Biden's administration does, in fact, support granting immunity is is the quid pro quo. I think a lot of people are guessing politically what I think it's I think it's pretty well established that there would be strings attached. Um, and and these this type of thing is something to be discussed in, in the meeting coming up. Um, so something to watch would be, you know, what the Biden administration would get or or ask in return from a real politique kind of perspective. I mean, so, Scott, do you think it's most likely that they will just continue to kick the can down the road? Because on the one hand, it does seem to me like they have to. I mean, I guess you say that they they don't necessarily have to weigh in, but um, in, in one sense, they have to deal with this sooner or later, the this being Jamal Khashoggi's murder. <laughs> On the other hand, the kick the can down the road approach has, I don't know if I would say it served the United States well, but it's it's certainly the approach that the United States seems to have gone with in some form or another with greater or lesser degrees of warmth toward Saudi Arabia. So, I mean, is this a decision moment or is it just another point where, where the government's just going to kind of wave its hands? It's hard to know for certain because of the political political dynamics around U.S.-Saudi relations right now, which are frankly always a big question mark. It is an important relationship um, that is easier to write off in words than it is in practice um, for U.S. officials, uh, even though it has a lot of downsides. I think all of us recognize, including some of the horrendous human rights conduct that they Saudi officials have engaged in and do engage in, of which the Khashoggi killing is a, but this is the most high profile example, but not the only one. Um, in this case, there are some precedents. There's a similar lawsuit around um, Mohammed bin Zayed, um, who was at the time a crown prince in UAE as in the 2012, 2014 era, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, maybe a little earlier. Um, and uh, there was came out later in some cables all publicly reporting. Doesn't, I didn't had no knowledge or engagement of this when I was at the State Department. For the record, I should I should clarify that. Um, but as it's been reported publicly, um, there was a termination made that because he was the crown prince, he wasn't actually the head of state, and it didn't fall under this category for title to this immunity. So there may be some internal precedent they can point to to say, "Hey, look, Saudi, sorry, we're already on the record on our view on this. This isn't the way this works." Um, more fundamentally, though, the issue it may actually go away for them. Um, you know, King Salman is old, he's not reportedly in bad health. And once he dies, if MBS is still the crown prince and then he becomes the king and then he is the head of state, then he gets a much more categorical level of immunity. At that point, this suit probably isn't going to be able to reach him uh, and certainly isn't going to be able to enforceable against him. Um, so they have a lot of incentives. The U.S. government, I think, in this case, is that even if this if this is a sensitive issue with the Saudis, and almost certainly is, the issue may go away for, for them without them really having to weigh in. And so in my mind, I'd be a little surprised if they weigh in one way or the other. I suspect they're just going to say, hey, court, why don't you figure it out? And you know, they can kind of wait. They can wait. Maybe they'll have to weigh in after if King Salman you know, hangs on a lot longer. Um, but who knows exactly? I think the possibility it may resolve itself um, is tempting enough that that they may just not want to weigh in here. Scott, as you mentioned, one thing we love to do is is rank speculation. So if I could ask you to to rankly speculate on, on one more thing, should the the United States government fail to grant MBS immunity and should the suit go through and he's charged, would U.S. Saudi relations change anyway? I mean. I think you know, as you as you well pointed to, the the Khashoggi murder was and dismemberment was was particularly heinous, but far from the first high profile human rights abuse. And yet, U.S. Saudi relations keep chugging along, albeit problematically. So, you know, is there a there there? I think in the case of of a, a guilty verdict. 
I, I think, you know, th- there might be um, some negative impact, but I suspect it's going to be kind of marginal at this point. I mean, really, the Biden administration has been pretty cool towards the Saudis up until these last few weeks. Um, and I don't think this meeting necessarily changes that. Um, the, the fundamental dynamics between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia have changed, but, and were changed primarily by the Khashoggi killing uh, and the array of other really insane things that MBS uh, and people around him seemed to do early in the Trump administration after perhaps getting some sort of wink and a nod from Trump administration officials that even they then had to roll back and say, hey, you shouldn't be blockading Qatar. You shouldn't be, uh, you know, detaining all these royal family members. You shouldn't be doing all this other stuff. Um, uh, and so it is a tricky, tricky um, position to say, like, is this going to be the straw that breaks the camel's break back to one regard or another? I would be kind of surprised because it's already kind of baked into the current coolness that nonetheless – both the Saudis and the Biden administration seem to be trying to find a way to get through to still work together on key issues of common importance, of which, again, there are substantial ones. Like, it's just not an actual easy relationship to move away from. Um, but, uh, you know, I, if anything, I suspect it'd be a small blip because, again, this lawsuit may end up dying of its own volition when King Solomon <laughs> dies of his own volition uh, and MBS becomes king. It's going to be very hard to enforce uh, regardless. Um, and so it's got a lot of symbolic importance. And I think a lot of people, for good reasons, want to see it move forward at this phase. But ultimately, it's not clear exactly what it's going to amount to. And if they do get a damages judgment, it won't be that hard for the Saudis to just pay off. It's certainly not going to hurt them financially. And they can come up with whatever public statement they say, we think this is wrongly decided, we reject this, but fine, here's the damages assessment, we'll give it in. And that's really what's at stake here. I completely forgot about the about the imprisonment episode where it was the the royal family was was sort of held in a Ritz Carlton. Was that what happened? It was a Ritz Carlton, but it was a Ritz Carlton of like not very nice conditions, evidently, because they put them in the Ritz and then they treated them very badly. You had saw these members of the royal family, like you know, these are billionaires, like really rich people, uh, come out like having lost thirty pounds uh, and like been suffered pretty bad treatment. It seemed, no although I don't service. think we have super strong reporting, no room service where where at least not of the type you want to receive. Um, so it was not. It was it was a wild couple of years there about things going on in Saudi Arabia. We haven't seen a repeat of that. Um, in part, I think, because the United States is, is more strongly signaled this is a real problem to our relationship. But the consequences are still echoing out from that. And the Khashoggi killing is just kind of the most visible one and the one with the most U.S. legal and jurisdictional hooks uh, of all these other things that are still hanging over the relationship. It's the, the the long arm of Jared Kushner continues to cast a shadow over <laughs> exactly. U.S. foreign policy. He is the, wink, like- and the wink and the nod. <laughs> Exactly. And new business partners, I believe, with uh, with uh, various Saudi business interests, I think, has come out recently in the last few weeks. I may be misquoting that, but I believe that's right. So uh, that relationship continues um, even after uh, exiting government. Well, having crossed the Atlantic, we're now going to cross it back in the other direction and talk about potential authoritarianism back at home in the United States. Um, back to back a, segues. That's yeah, what we call yeah, the segue right. 180. Quint uh-huh, is uh-huh. on it. I yeah, love it. No, I, I, I came prepared. Um, so love it. <laughs> and and now I've completely lost my train of thought. So the, <laughs> <laughs> mission accomplished. Perfect. <laughs> so to cap off a truly exceptional in whatever meaning of the word you choose, a uh, term, uh, the Supreme Court announced that it would grant certiorari in the case Moore versus Harper, which I have to say really just like rolls off the tongue. Uh, it's very mellifluous. Um, a case that I have seen reported as potentially ending democracy as we know it. Um, I don't know if it's quite that bad, but it does seem very concerning. So this has to do with what is now known as the independent state legislature doctrine. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Scott to give us the ins and outs, but essentially the bottom line is that it would give, as it suggests, uh, state legislatures an enormous amount of power over uh, running federal elections within those states. And this is particularly important right now because uh, certain variations on that theory were really the cornerstone of a lot of efforts by people uh, close to Trump to overturn the 2020 election. So the court has not... uh, explicitly considered this before. Uh, Particular justices have weighed in, but this is the first time that the court would really be taking up the question. I think there are some questions about whether this case is really the right vehicle for that because of some complicated issues about the the particular uh, question. 
presented here. Um, but it is a moment where, you know, if if we're looking at a court that has really, I think, taken quite a hard turn to the right, uh, this is a theory that has seen adoption on the right, um, although I think farther toward the fringe. Uh, is this something that the court would go for and or a majority of justices on the court would go for? And if so, what would the results be? for uh, the integrity of American elections going forward, especially as we think about potential efforts to overturn the election again in 2024. So Scott, I know you've thought a fair amount about this. Um, let's just start off with the, the question that is on all of our minds. Just how bad could this be? It's a very good question. It certainly could be bad uh, because the fundamental argument that's kind of underlying this doctrinal question is this question of when the Constitution specifically references a state legislature, which it does multiple times, uh, and says the legislature shall do X, not just a state shall do X, does it mean literally the legislature has to have that authority to some extent that the state Supreme Court can't supersede or that other constitutional processes within the state can't supersede such as as a, uh, the ability to install legislation through a referendum of some sort. That was actually an issue before the Supreme Court in 2015 in an uh, Arizona-related case where that ability to install uh, independent kind of bodies through referendum was actually upheld, but by four, uh, by slim margins. And so this could come back and kind of threaten that, among a lot of other measures. This particular case is about a, the elections clause of the Constitution, which is about who who gets to draw the lines of congressional elections and manage the rules about federal congressional elections. The election clause basically says state legislatures do this, but can be superseded by uh, the federal Congress if 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 it so sees as appropriate sees that as appropriate. But people say, well. This doctrine, you know, any ruling here might have a bearing on the electors clause of the Constitution, which is not an issue in this case, but says state legislatures also determine who gets to appoint presidential electors who determine who is the president. Uh, and it doesn't as clearly carve out a role for Congress in regulating that, unfortunately, uh, as the elections clause does for other federal elections. Um, and of course, actually, for the first couple of federal elections in the United States, Several states actually appointed their electors through the state legislature. They did not have popular elections for them. So there's actually a pretty established historical record that this is something states at least used to be able to do. Although maybe subsequent developments like the 14th Amendment and other items make that much more difficult now than, than it used to be. Uh, you know, what I will say here is I think there is a lot of alarmism around the around this particular case because of what we've seen this court do in the last week or two, which is install such dramatic changes in the Supreme Court. I'm not sure the tea leaves are there to suggest that there is a majority to go with the boldest vision of the independent state legislature doctrine, which is to say that state legislature can do whatever they want and no other state institution can stop them. I don't think that makes any sense personally. I don't find even the weaker version of this argument that persuasive personally, but I'm not sure that even the conservative justices on the court find uh, you know, the strongest versions of this persuasive. It seems like there's kind of an array of different views and different contexts. Uh, and so I'm not sure we're likely to get um, the a sort of outcome that's as damning as that. But that doesn't mean it's not going to have election consequences. The one thing I'll note is this case is not a surprise for anyone that this came up. Um, we, the Supreme Court actually ruled on this in March when there was an effort to get an emergency action uh, so that it could impact the upcoming congressional elections. That was rejected, but we saw three conservative justices, Alito, Gorsuch, Gorsuch and Thomas say, hey, we would have given this cert now. We would have taken this up. And Kavanaugh said, I don't want to do it on an emergency basis, but the, if this came through the usual cert process, process, I would support granting cert. Um, notably, Kavanaugh actually didn't weigh in on whether he thought um, the uh, that the challengers here actually made their case, whereas the other three did. They said, we think on balance, we would have found that they were likely enough to prevail, that we should have taken emergency action in their favor and stayed the lower court, uh, or actually probably stayed the state court's kind of determination. Um, but uh, regardless, that doesn't mean Kavanaugh won't kind of go this way. And we can dissect their views a little bit if we want to dig deeper into this. Um, but first, I want to open up to you all. Like, What is your reaction to this idea? Does this sound plausible and 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 why do you think it's having triggering such strong reactions well first i want to agree with quinta that it is quite a mellifluous uh sounding <laughs> case and i and i know i agree with her because i just looked up the word and that checks out i agree um i think my initial reaction after reading about the legal theory and and hearing that that the court was taking it up was the question of, of of whether the court is now 
if there's a danger that it's sort of using up its its capital, so to speak, after controversial ruling, controversial ruling, is is there an endless font of, of legitimacy for the court in the eyes of of the American public, or or is it is it waning? You know, after all of these high profile cases, um, again, we don't know, as you said, that exactly how this particular case will play out. But that was my sort of overarching question when when I heard about the case. Right. I mean, I guess I, I find it hard to say that the anxiety over the court taking up this case is not merited given precisely what you've just both pointed to that the this is a court that has taken has has shown that it is it is okay with taking quite aggressive action uh in ways that are broadly unpopular among the majority of people. Now you can say, well, they shouldn't care about that, et cetera, et cetera. But I think just, you know, looking at, at the facts on the ground, like th- this is, this is not a court that is trying to put the brakes on. So if you were going to say, you know, if, if you really wanted to say, you know what, we do think that this is the right way to interpret the elections clause. It does strike me that, you know, this is a court that might just say, you know, damn the torpedoes, we're going for it. Um, Again, I don't think we have enough of a sense of what the particular justices think on this issue to have a really great sense. But I I very much understand why people, and that includes, by the way, not just, you know, average people, journalists, but also real election law experts, like, for example, Rick Hassan, um, essentially looking this at this as, you know, a bomb that might go off. Um, it might not, but <laughs> it, it might. I mean, and that also, I mean, Scott, one, one question that I found, or one aspect of this that I found really interesting is how it kind of speaks to the tensions right now within the conservative legal movement when it comes to, frankly, authoritarianism or not authoritarianism. So one of the major opponents of the independent state legislature theory is uh, Michael Ludig, who listeners might be familiar with. He testified during the January 6 hearings um, at the, the same hearing where we heard about the efforts to pressure Pence, uh, really pushing back on the interpretation of the Constitution put forward by Trump advisor John Eastman, uh, his former clerk. There's a nice little familiar drama element. Um, and Ludig, I noted, uh, put out a, a Twitter thread, um, which we can link to in the show notes, basically saying that he thinks that this idea is bunk um, and extremely dangerous. And so I found that interesting because, I mean, I think that you can look at the divide in terms of how sort of conservative jurists and lawyers uh, approach the effort to steal the 2020 election by Trump as a divide between, you know, the people who are committed to the Constitution and the people who are not. But you could also look at it as, you know, well, what if you say, you know, we've we've presented this legal theory, it's more nuanced in in some manifestations than the theories that say John Eastman was putting forward about how the Electoral Count Act is unconstitutional or, or stuff like that. You know, we've written our brief, it looks official, we've made the argument and, you know, in a calm voice without hyperbole and without saying things about how Dominion, you know, flipped 100,000 votes or things like that. Is there a way to present an argument that is genuinely extremely dangerous for American democracy in a way that could appeal to jurists who might otherwise say, you know, well, I'm not, you know, who, who aren't sort of fully bought in on the Trump project. And that was why I thought that uh, Liddig's uh, commentary was particularly interesting because he seemed to really be trying to draw a line in the sand and say, no, this is not acceptable. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, Scott, I'm curious what you think about that. Is that a fair characterization? I think it is. You know, Ludwig's critique, I think, is one you would expect, actually, from a lot of kind of conventional legal conservatives, which is essentially, he says, look, this just completely undermines the structure, the conventional structure of federalism. Um, we're saying that you are allowing the federal government to, in fact, supersede all these state constitutional structures that states can set up by superpowering the state legislature in this regard. And in a case where he kind of leans on this as a, as a possible, as I understand it, a possible way to resolve the case without actually reaching the constitutional issue, he leads on the point that this is like the established practice. The legislature hasn't said everything we enact isn't subject to state constitutional review, um, as is commonly the case with other legislation under the state constitution. So even if they had that authority, it's not clear they've exercised it yet. So why are are we stepping in and saying, no, in fact, you, you've we're going to say that this measure is, is immune from review, even though the state legislature has never come out and actually said that yet. They said in litigation, haven't said it in 
an enactment of the legislatures, which is how legislators actually speak. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of compelling logic behind that argument. And frankly, we've seen discomfort among the conservatives in the court and how they approach this in various ways, or maybe not discomfort, but how they kind of cabin their arguments. So we've got the three justices, Gorsuch, Thomas, and uh, Alito, who have said in this specific case, oh, we would have given cert earlier, we would have granted an emergency motion, and we think that the people challenging um, the, the North Carolina Supreme Court's decision to invalidate these congressional redistricting, which is kind of the, the underlying dispute, is a pro have the right of the argument, but even there, their argument really hinges on the degree of review the Supreme Court of state of the state can exercise over the legislatures. They really draw out this narrative, saying this is a case where the Supreme Court of North Carolina completely reversed its prior precedents, invented these principles based off very broadly worded provisions in the state constitution, and overrode the state legislature not once but twice. And this sort of exceptional, uh, exceptionally discretionary review is what we find problematic. Whether that means they would find certain other things that might be distinguishable on different fact patterns equally problematic, I think is a little less clear. I don't think there should be a lot of hope in that. Like this is a court that's very willing to open the door to pretty broad arguments without clarifying them uh, and is really willing to kind of stick its nose in a lot of things that usually we wouldn't would think judges don't want to be involved in. But regardless, so they that that does mean at least it's not clear all three are a hundred percent embracing the strongest possible argument. Then you saw Justice Kavanaugh say, hey, in another case regarding Wisconsin, um, invoke this argument, but primarily in the context of saying a federal district court shouldn't be superseding a state legislature requirement about when you had to get absentee ballots in in the context of um, of uh, COVID restrictions, basically saying, extending the deadline for getting those in in 2020. That is, you know invoking the same doctrine, but in a very different context. There you're saying, look, the Constitution gave this to state legislatures. Uh, each federal court should supersede that. That doesn't bear in on whether states can actually restrain state legislatures and engage in constitutional review of state legislation, Remember, bearing in mind that the state legislature is a product of the state Constitution. Um, same with uh, just Chief Justice Roberts. In 2015, the Arizona case I mentioned, he wrote the lead dissent that basically invoked the similar argument for saying, no, you know, Congress shouldn't be, or probably state legislatures or States shouldn't be able to strip redistricting authority away from the state legislature and give it to another body through referendum. The Constitution gives it expressly to the state legislature. But you know, Roberts didn't sign on to uh, the opinion in this case earlier. Didn't support the emergency measure. Uh, it's not clear. Didn't come out and say he would have supported cert. So we don't know if that argument is cabined to that sort of exceptional case or bleeds into this broader view. And Amy Coney Barrett's complete, you know mystery. We have no idea how she feels about this. We do know that in the Bruin case recently, she actually uh, wrote a separate uh, concurrence basically to lay out differences in the very, very technical methodology of originalism uh, between what Justice Thomas applied there and went into great detail on and separated it out to say, well, here are a couple issues I may view a little differently. People should think about differently. If nothing else, it suggests that she really has strong views on the methodology of originalism. And a lot of originalists have said that including Luddig, have said that this really doesn't hold water if you really dig into it. So she might not reach the same conclusion and, again, chose not to join either Kavanaugh or the three other just conservative justices earlier this year um, when they weighed in and said, oh, we would have supported cert in this or we do support cert. So long story short, I'm just not sure we know the views of the justices enough to say firmly we know what the outcome is. And it's a wide, diverse range of outcomes in this case. So I think it could be a major threat to democracy. I'm not sure we we can say that confidently. Um, the real reality is there's a whole round of spectrums of options there. I, I, a question for you guys as, as observers of the court um, and people, public commentators on it, especially in your case, Quinta, is, you know, how do you all think the dynamics around the kind of panic feed into it? I think, Tyler, your observation about the public legitimacy is a really good one. But, you know, what motivates these sorts of um, reactions to these cases? I think a lot of it does come from the Supreme Court's recent reactions. But I also, frankly, suspect a lot of these op-eds were written before, uh, <laughs> were written in March when we saw the Supreme Court take an initial action on this, knowing that this was probably going to get cert at some point this term. And so may not have been reacting to Dobbs and Bruin as clearly. Um, you know, is it productive to take a more alarmist tone? Is it appropriate or is it um, is it maybe counterproductive? How do we think that influences the court's thinking? I'm, I honestly don't have strong feelings. I don't know how how to approach this and how to balance my own deep concerns with my assessment that it may not be as clean cut as it, as it actually appears on first blush. Yeah. So two points here. So one is that I think this might be might be a good example of what Jack Goldsmith uh, described in a, a really great lawfare essay some time ago as a libertarian panic, 
um, which I believe he did not mean derisively, uh, essentially referring to a phenomenon where Trump would sort of make a noise about doing X and X was bad in you know, any number of ways. And people would not unjustifiably freak out and the freak out would itself push Trump into not doing X. And so Jack's argument was that then you you end up in this place where the people who freaked out look like they were freaking out without reason because the thing didn't happen, but the panic was itself part of what prevented X from taking place in the first place. And so I do think that there there is a kind of a libertarian panic element to this, and, and I, I certainly don't mean that derisively um, in this sense. I do think if we are thinking about the public legitimacy of the court, which, I mean, how can we not, right? I think Pew showed that it's plummeted like 15 points uh, from last year. That was before Dobbs and Bruin. Granted, I think the Dobbs decision, the draft had already leaked at that point, so I don't know to what extent that was baked in, but it's clearly an institution that is in a rocky place when it comes to how the public engages with it. Um, and so I do think that that element of libertarian panic is is important to keep in mind. The other element is, look, I, I might be repeating myself here, but the slate of decisions the court handed down, particularly Dobbs and Bruin, but not exclusively, really have, I know the strict scrutiny folks have called it the YOLO court. We might also uh, uh, refer to that great clip of a young Bill O'Reilly and call it sort of F it, we'll do it live energy. Um, it just, I mean... You could have written these opinions in a way that was not, did not have the vibe of just kind of setting everything on fire, and they did, you know? So what, once you get to a point where you've undercut the sort of foundations of substantive due process in such an aggressive way, again, whatever you think about that on the merits, but really just kind of cutting at the core of this legal principle that has been at the center of so much of American jurisprudence in the 20th and 21st century and kind of said like, yeah, we don't like that anymore. Like that's gone. I mean, again, I'm not even talking about the, um, uh, I can't think of the name of the case, but the case that's quasi overturned McGirt, the Oklahoma uh, Native American reservation case. There, there's just a, a sense of kind of like anything goes. Um, and so I think it is reasonable for people to not necessarily trust the court to behave uh, carefully, wisely, uh, as many people have said, this is this is not the Roberts court anymore, <laughs> um, functionally. And so, I certainly, I think that the arguments that you know, it's it's certainly not a given that they're just going to set everything on fire make a certain amount of sense. But I wouldn't trust them not to, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with that. And and just to add, I think. I'm not surprised anymore by alarmism, and I, and I do see the utility in it, just given the past however many years. I think what's interested me about this particular case is the the tenor of the alarmism. It's been almost like a nuanced alarmism. You can sort of see in some of the commentary that people are are raising the alarm but preempting arguments. So, for example, you you see some articles that that kind of take the line that you know whether or not you agree with originalism this doesn't make sense within the theory of originalism. So I, I, I feel like it's, it's almost like a, a, <laughs> alarmists have matured maybe after so much practice. Um, but, but to that point, um, and, and Scott, you were, you were getting at, at this a little bit, to what extent do you think this falls within originalism? Should, should the, you know, it kind of pan out the way that the alarmists think it might? Um, to what extent can, can this argument be made within Within originalism, given the fact that, um, as some have pointed out, there's there's new historical evidence, you know, to the contrary. That's a great question, and it's worth noting. There's been really good scholarship that's come out since 2020. Actually, before 2022, there's good scholarship since 2020, where this issue kind of came back to the fore again for the first major time since Bush v. Gore. Really, um, in this context, there's been really interesting legal scholarship brought forward, and there is a really strong originalist case to raise serious doubts about this. If nothing else, we know states you know, in the early Republic after the adoption of the constitution enacted state constitutional provisions that relate to federal elections. 
they wouldn't have done that uh, if they didn't think that they had the authority uh, to supersede that. So at least people at the time didn't clearly have the understanding that at least the most extreme version of independent state legislature doctrine uh, would embrace. At least it seems that way to me, uh, although I haven't dug into it yet. That's going to be really interesting over the next few months. I mean, I think we're going to see a lot on this and a lot of people pulling the scholarship that's dug into this. And more and more, that's going to be part of our top court appellate litigation and down through the lower courts, this court is very willing to say a lot hinges on the original understanding and early practice. And those are historical resources and tools that lawyers just aren't really trained to actually dig into super, super readily. Um, so we're going to see a lot of scholarship and scholarship is going to become a lot more important around this and lots of other issues. Uh, and hopefully scholars, you know, historical scholars catch up and, and begin contributing sooner rather than later to this particular question before we, um, get get fully dug in. Not that they haven't already, they have, but uh, perhaps even more squarely than they may be used to in the past. Yeah. I mean, to to that point, I will say my object lesson touches on this as well. So stay tuned, listeners. Um, as someone who's friends with a lot of historians, uh, if you try to explain how the Supreme Court um, approaches originalism and historical research to them, their jaws just kind of become slack with horror because, you know, like these are people who spend an entire career trying to figure out like how many sheep were in a particular village in medieval Germany. And the justices are just out there making big, broad statements on the basis of, you know, contested evidence um, that substantially changes the the scope of American law. So, I mean, I certainly hope that, you know, trained historians become part of this conversation, but I also feel like that work takes a really long time. So, you know, we're going to get like the definitive book on the question of, of to what extent state legislatures were solely empowered like 30 years from now. And by that point, it's going to be too late. But it, it always reminds me of the potentially apocryphal quote by the Chinese premier in the 70s when asked about what he made of the French Revolution and he said, too early to tell. On that note, unfortunately, we have hit our time limit for today. Uh, we have to cut the conversation short. But of course, this would not be rational security if we did not leave you with some object lessons to think over for the rest of your week. Quinto, why don't I hand over to you to get us started? So my object lesson is a tweet, a tweet from one Julian Davis Mortensen, uh, who is a constitutional law professor and author with Nicholas Bagley of some incredibly interesting scholarship about the original meaning of the vesting clause in the Constitution. Um, he has written some incredibly interesting articles, and uh, he put up a video uh, that is a, a stop motion video of him in the library at the University of Michigan, where he teaches of uh, every volume of some of the key collections of research that he he drew on uh, while carrying out this work over the course of ten years. Uh, and so we will put it in the in the notes. You can look. It is Julian just piling up just an unbelievable amount of books. And it is not, of course, even all of the books that he used. Um, so first off, it's just a delightful little piece of media. But I think it's it's also an incredible reminder that like conducting this kind of research seriously is hard. It takes an unbelievably long amount of time. I did see one person respond to the tweet saying like, you know, after Bruin, every everyone bringing a case uh, about gun regulation is going to have to do this level of work. Um, and just a reminder that like, it's it's not easy to to do this kind of stuff well. It takes a lot of time. I will also say if folks listening to this do not follow Julian on Twitter, you should because he is the rare combination of somebody who has incredibly painstaking scholarship and then one of the more irreverent, entertaining Twitter uh, accounts to follow with still having lots of substance mixed in there. Uh, it is it is, it is very entertaining for, uh, for those uh, deep in the weeds on these things are so worth checking out. For my object lesson this week, I am revisiting a topic I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago and have promised to follow up on it. I'm still going to do a deeper follow up on it, but I had the opportunity twice now in the past two weeks to do one of my favorite culinary summer adventures, and I'm going to pass along to you, which is grilling pizza. People think of grilling as like a barbecue thing, right? You're like burgers and hot dogs. When you're a vegetarian, that's not very entertaining. Veggie burgers can be fine. We really want to try something different. And pizza is the way to do it. Grill is the best way to cook pizza at home because it's open flame. It gets very high temperatures. It's amazing. Um, so I am, for my object lesson this week, encouraging folks to grill your pizza. Um, I follow a method that I got from Jay Kenji Lopez-Alt over at Serious Eats years ago, and I've been doing it for years, and I forgot how wonderful it is. Um, I have a much more complex home setup uh, that I will someday tweet 
tweet about and maybe share a little later this summer once I get it up and running again. It involves several plates of solid steel and some heat-proof bricks. It's very exciting. But until I get back to that, I've been on the road the last couple of weeks and still grilling just in the grills here at my Darius Airbnbs, and it's phenomenal. Um, so check out this article from uh, Kenji. It's a phenomenal method everyone should be doing. It should become the new summer staple. I'll include a couple of little tweaks that I have done um, that I found it really useful as somebody who's probably done it hundreds of times now as it's my favorite uh, summer cookout method. Uh, so keep an eye on that. Uh, unless you think I am only using object lessons to refer you to old weird law review articles, uh, I'm back in the culinary game. So get ready, folks. I got some more coming up the next couple of weeks. Tyler, why don't we hand over to you for our last object lesson? Sure. My object lesson is decidedly less delicious, though hopefully just as nourishing. It is a book um, called Orwell's Roses by the wonderful essayist Rebecca Solnit. Uh, it was given to me by a dear friend who knows I love Orwell's nonfiction. This is, I'm sure there's a lot of biographies out there about him. This is a very curious one. It sort of takes his gardening um, habit and uses that to build a portrait around Orwell. But it's so much more in true Rebecca Solnit fashion. She goes down a million rabbit holes about coal mining, trees, root systems, other revolutionaries and thinkers. Um, it's it's a journey and it's um, it's really, it's a beautiful book. Well, wonderful. I, I like that. I have somebody who's gotten quite into gardening themselves. I'm I'm more inclined to check it out uh, than uh, maybe I would have before uh, before this past summer. Well, unfortunately, that brings us to the end of this week's episode. But Rational Security 2.0 is, like its forebear, a production of Lawfare. Follow us on Twitter at RATL Security and be sure to leave a rating or review wherever you might be listening. And while you're at it, visit lawfareblog.com for our show page with links and past episodes for our written work and the written work of other Lawfare contributors and for information on Lawfare's other wonderful podcast series, including, among others, The Aftermath, our special series on the investigations into January 6th. And be sure to sign up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon for an ad-free version of this podcast and other special benefits. Our audio engineer and producer this week was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo, and our music, as always, was performed by Sophia Yan. We are this week being edited by the wonderful crew at Goat Rodeo. On behalf of my co-host Quinta, my absent co-host Alan, and our special guest Tyler McBrien, I am Scott R. Anderson, and we